This video is going to prepare you for the Praxis Core Mathematics exam, test code 5733. This video is going to cover three things. What's on the test and how to study for it, the most likely concepts that will be on the test, and we're going to take a look at a few practice questions. Ready? Let's go! Now, the Praxis Core Math exam consists of 56 total questions that come from three overarching categories. The categories are number and quantity, data interpretation and representation, statistics and probability, and algebra and geometry. Each category has an outline of what to expect in that category. But as you'll see here in a minute, they're still pretty overwhelming. Thankfully, we've done the research for you, and you can find exactly what you need to know in our study guide. Link in the description below. But let's go ahead and talk about some key concepts now. The first category we'll look at is number and quantity, since it's worth the largest chunk of your exam at 36%. This means you'll see about 20 questions on your test come from this section. The big things you're going to see here include understanding magnitude, operations, and fractions and ratios. I know some of those titles might still be a little intimidating, but we'll translate them from math language and break down what you actually need to know starting with magnitude. Magnitude basically refers to your ability to understand what a number represents. So questions on place value show up in this section a lot. That means you'll need to understand a place value chart, like this one, and the value each digit within a larger number holds. For example, the digit 7 appears in each of these three numbers, but it holds a different value in each. In 5,237, 7 is in the 1's place and has the value of 7. In 7,852, 7 is in the 1,000's place and has a value of 7,000. And in 82 and 47 thousandths, 7 is in the 1,000's place and has a value of 0 .007. Let's take a look at operations. Since you already know the value of each number, now you need to know what to do with them. So basically, you're going to need to know how to add, subtract, multiply, divide, and use parentheses and exponents. You're going to need to do it in the right order. Remember PEMDAS? And you'll need to be able to do all of those things with all real numbers. So that includes fractions, decimals, and negative numbers. And if that sounds like a lot, you should check out our study guide where we help you through all of it. Let me show you an example from our study material of a problem type you're likely to see on your test. Simplify this expression. See, here's PEMDAS front and center. We use PEMDAS to know which order we need to follow as we work through the problem to make sure we get the right answer. Need help remembering the order of PEMDAS? There are lots of mnemonic devices out there, but a popular one is, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Last one in this category, fractions and ratios. So, yeah, you'll need to know about fractions and ratios, but also about decimals and percents, and how to convert between them. So if you're given a fraction, you need to be able to convert it into a decimal that represents the same value. Want to see how we teach this concept in our study guide? Let's check out one of our super helpful videos. Let's look closer at ratios. A ratio is a comparison that shows the relative size of two or more values. A ratio can be a part-to-part -part comparison, or a part to whole comparison. Suppose there are two yellow blocks and five blue blocks. We can write the ratio in several part to part ways, with a colon, with the word two, or as a fraction. Like what you saw? Then you should subscribe to the 240 study guide to get a ton more where that came from. Link in the description. Let's head over to data interpretation and representation, statistics, and probability. Do you mind if I just shorten that to data and stats for the rest of this video? I feel like that will literally shave five minutes off our time together. Sweet. Data and stats it is. The data and stats category makes up about 32% of your exam, or about 18 questions total. In this category, you're going to need to be able to interpret data and draw a conclusion. You'll also need to be able to understand different types of data representations, like bar graphs, pie charts, and scatter plots, and how to read them. Finally, you'll need to be able to calculate simple probabilities. First up, data interpretation. A lot of what you'll see here are the measures of central tendency. So we're talking mean, median, mode, and range. Need a refresher on those? I've got you. Five students have their height measured. The data set is 158, 155, 
164, 155, 168. What is the mean, median, mode, and range? First, rearrange the data from least to greatest. The mean is the average. So all these numbers added up divided by the number of data points, or 5, gives us 160. The median is the middle value, so 158. The mode is the number that appears most often. Since the value 155 appears twice, that's our mode. Finally, the range is the largest value minus the smallest value. So 168 minus 155, our range is 13. Nice. Let's check out how you represent all of that data you just interpreted. You're going to need to know how to represent data in a graph or plot. You might be given a data set and asked which graph or plot would best be used to represent the data. Here's a list of common graphs and plots along with the type of data they best represent. If you're working with categorical data, choose a bar graph or pie chart. If you're working with quantitative data, you've got some more options. Line graphs track changes over time. Dot plots and stem and leaf plots are best with small data sets. And box plots and histograms are better with large data sets. Ready to check out calculating probabilities? We've got a great video on this in our guide. Let's take a look. Probability is the likelihood of an event occurring. Mathematically, it equals the number of successful outcomes possible over the total number of outcomes possible. Consider trying to roll a 5 on a standard 6-sided die. There is one way to have a successful outcome and 6 possible total outcomes. So, the probability is 1 over 6. The notation used for probability is a P, followed by parentheses to indicate the event. For example, P parentheses 5 means the probability of rolling a 5 on a die. All probabilities will fall between 0 and 1. A probability of 0 means that an outcome is impossible. For example, let's think about rolling a die. The probability of getting 7 on a dice roll is 0, since there's no 7 face. On the other hand, a probability of 1 means that an outcome is certain or guaranteed. The probability that a single die roll results in a number less than 10 is 1, since all of the numbers on a six-sided die are less than 10. So helpful, right? Our team will have you mathing your way to a passing score in no time. That's it for data and stats. Last category on the list is algebra and geometry. Just like the previous category, this one makes up 32% of your exam, or the last 18 questions. This category breaks down into two pretty obvious chunks, algebra and geometry. But each of these chunks still has a ton of information in it. We'll still pick out one super important nugget from each that you're likely to see on your test. Let's start with algebra. Sometimes you'll get a scenario and you'll need to come up with an expression or equation that represents that scenario. For example, Maria uses one-fourth of a stick of butter for each recipe of muffins she makes. If she makes 18 batches of muffins this month, how many sticks of butter will she use? Write the correct computation to solve the problem. You need to pick out keywords and phrases that help you build this computation. We match up each part of the explanation with part of a mathematical sentence. We get the answer 1 fourth times 18 equals the number of sticks of butter Maria needs. One of the things that will really help you with this section is knowing what keywords to look out for and what they mean. This is just a small sampling of words you could see in your test questions. We've got a lot more of those for you to check out in our study guide. On to geometry. In the geometry section, you're going to need to know your basic shapes and the rules that govern each of them, like the formulas for finding different measurements within a known shape. So if you're given a shape and its outside measurements, you may be asked to solve for the area or perimeter. Let's try to find the area of this shape. We can split this shape into a triangle and a rectangle. From there, we can use known formulas to solve for each. The area of a rectangle is length times width. So in this case, 6 times 4, or 24. Then the triangle is 1 half times base times height. So 1 half times 6 times 2, or 6. Add them both together, and the area of the shape is 30 centimeters squared. 
And here's the thing. In our study guide, we've got this information in the graphic you just saw, and we also have that same info in a video. So you can choose how you want to study. And that's it. We've gone through all the categories. And if you don't understand each of these concepts, use the 240 study guide. It'll save you a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of worry. We're so confident in our guides that we offer a money-back guarantee. Now that we've gone over some of the big concepts in our three areas, let's look at some practice questions to show you how those concepts can appear on the test. If you want a lot of practice questions, you can click the free practice test below. At the end, you get a score report on how well you did on the test. Now for the questions. Remember way back in the beginning of this video when we talked about place value? Let's look at how that is reflected in a question. What is the value of the 7 in the number 432 and 769 ten thousandths? The 7 is the second number after the decimal, so it has the value of 7 hundredths, or 7 divided by 100. So, this is the correct answer. How about PEMDIS? Simplify the expression. Parentheses are addressed first. So the first step in this problem is to perform the subtraction of 6 minus 2 equals 4. From there, the problem becomes 200 minus 3 times 4 cubed plus 10. Exponents should be handled next. In this case, 4 is raised to the third power, resulting in 200 minus 3 times 64 plus 10. Multiplication of the 3 with 64 must be completed before subtraction or addition can occur leaving 200 minus 192 plus 10. Subtraction and addition are to be simplified in the order in which they appear from left to right. Accordingly, 200 minus 192 plus 10 equals 8 plus 10 equals 18. So, choice A is correct. Now, let's look at one where you need to convert between a fraction and a percent. Ooh, this one's a bit tricky. A class is learning about ratios and percentages. The teacher tells the class that at last Friday night's football game, there were between 800 and 1,000 people. Of those at the football game, about 13 to 17% of the people had blonde hair. Which of the following is the most reasonable estimate of the number of people at the football game with blonde hair? We start by using 15%, the average number of 13% and 17%, as the percentage estimate. So 15% of 800 people would be 120, and 15% of 1,000 people would be 150. It's reasonable to estimate that between 120 and 150 people at the football game had blonde hair. 135 is the only number that fits within this range, so this is the best choice. One category down, two to go. Moving on to data and stats. Let's look at a question from that data interpretation section. The number of inches of snowfall in Selbyville is graphed in the bar chart below. What is the mean number of inches of snowfall per month from November to March? To find the mean, we need to add up all values and divide them by the number of values in the data set. So, 5 plus 7 plus 9 plus 8 plus 1, which equals 30. There are 5 data points, so 30 divided by 5 gives us 6. So, this one is correct. Nice. What about data interpretation? A school cafeteria offers five different meals and serves each meal on a set day of the week. A teacher takes a survey among her students of which of the five meals is their favorite. Which of the following should the teacher use to display the results of the survey? A pie chart is a great way to visually depict how many students named each of the five meals as their favorite because it visually divides a whole by percentages. So, this choice is best. How about a probability question? What do those look like? Five cards are randomly chosen without replacement from an ordinary deck of 26 black and 26 red cards. What expression shows the probability that all five cards are red? The first time we pull a card, we have a 26 out of 52 chance of it being red. So right away, we can eliminate choices C and D. When we go to pull our second card, the number of red cards and total cards in the deck has decreased. So now we have a 25 out of 51 chance of pulling a red card. Choice A is correct. Each time a card is drawn, the probability changes. Nice. So we've only got one category left, algebra and geometry. 
Let's start with algebra and take a look at one of those questions where you have to write a number sentence for a given situation. Maria baked six dozen cookies for her classmates. There are 28 students in her class. Each child received two cookies, and Maria gave six cookies each to her teacher and her principal. Which expression shows the number of cookies she had left over? The six times 12 gives us the total number of cookies in six dozen, which is what Maria is starting with. Then, we need to determine how many she gave away. Then, if each child receives two and there are 28 children, two times 28. And if the teacher and the principal each receive six, that is another six times two. So, we have six times 12 minus the quantity of two times 28 added to two times six. So, this is the best choice. Nice! Now let's do one where we solve for a variable. Last up is geometry. What is the area in square units of the figure pictured? Just like the example we looked at earlier, we can break this into two smaller shapes, a triangle and a rectangle. The rectangle has sides of 5 and 4 to get an area of 20 units squared. The triangle has a base of 4 and a height of 3 to get an area of 6 units squared. Finally, we add the two areas together to get 26 units squared. So this answer is the best one. Whew. Now that's just a small sliver of practice questions to give you an idea about how these concepts are assessed on the test. There is still plenty more to learn. If you really wanna make sure you're prepared for the Praxis Core Math exam, take the next step and subscribe to the 240 Study Guide. It has hours of videos so you can watch and listen while doing chores. It is test aligned with hundreds of practice questions so you know precisely what you need to study and it has the money back guarantee. So click the link below right now to get started. <laughs>